Yeah, it's amazing in these years how many people have come to me and expressed the desire to become trainers, how many started and then how many just kind of managed and uh, could sustain it. This, this is a great tough industry to make a living. Incredible enough. You know, if anybody really wants to, the first item of this workshop was going to be, so you want to be a trainer, huh? That's how we, but then I thought well, that's a bit too negative. But uh, <laughs> a trainer's that's like, you know, that's a case of death. You don't become negative. But yeah, but it's a, it's a tough, tough run to crack. Anyone else? How about Professor? Well, basically, yeah. anybody? Basically, I think it's uh, more about creating. So, uh, like, on the surface, everybody knows how, um, what, what does it take to be a trainer. Right. But when you get into a little depth, <coughs> it really has to relate to someone who has that kind of experience that you have. Yeah. <coughs> Don't you think it's a bit self-defeating to train others to train and put yourself out of the market? Sorry? <laughs> and you're a, and that and yeah, and you know, a lot of people uh, work through that paradigm. Yeah. And but what I've done is I've made all my content public. It's on the website, my presentations, everything I create. And I just say, use it, use it, use it. And uh, and then I keep training people and I encourage everyone, if you have to you think you've got what it takes, whichever way I can help you, I'll help you. Uh, I haven't seen that take money, I haven't seen that take food away from my table. You know, so if it doesn't hurt me, and why should I worry about a fear that has never come to pass? So a positive approach is what yeah. helps you feel. So, no, it's, it's uh, scientific evidence. Show me the proof that it hurts, and, and I'll stop doing it. I just haven't seen the evidence. How did you avoid creating a creator and teacher? That's one of the topics. <laughs> okay, Here, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to start my sort of spiel. And anytime you have any questions, just either raise your hand or scream it out or you know, whichever way would pass it through me. I, one of the games I'm really bad at, and that's called Guess What I'm Thinking. <laughs> you know, so I said, I'm not a mind reader, I don't have extra vision. I can pick up a few cues here and there when people start to tune up, but the uh, rest of the time, you know, I need to know what's happening. So do talk to me. So here it goes. I'm going to start with a disclaimer. Please, I'm not a guru. A lot of people say that. I'm not a guru. Guru is something else. I don't even know what a guru is. You know, for me, Guruji is, you know, this sort of thing. He sits under a big tree and meditates half the time and then he says something so profound at least I can't. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not, I'm not even an expert. The reason I say that is because I don't know what are the qualifications of someone to be an expert in training, number one. And number two, I don't recall anyone having put me through those qualifications for me to pop out on the other end and then certify me as a trainer, like allow me to go, you know. So, how can anyone call me a trainer? If I don't call myself an expert on training. Uh, my opinions that I'm going to share with you are just opinions. So don't take them to be the truth. Find your own truth. My ideas, if applied, will probably backfire. Um, unless you're very, very lucky. So my ideas are very crazy, very radical, very risky. And uh, that's just the way I am. So, you know, don't sue me afterwards and don't say, I'm saying that the manager here will just suffer for I got fired for my job. Uh, can you see this at the back? Yeah. Is it big enough? Okay, because I have another backup, which is a bigger font than everything. That's not as pretty as this. Uh, I tried to be a trainer, but I ended up actually become, becoming more like a janitor. What do I mean by that? I mean that I find myself going into organizations and cleaning up the mess that these bosses are leaving behind. <laughs> <laughs> I, walk, I walk in with a mop and a broom and, you know, and now I walk in a soft room, then do a shorter day. And it just baffles my mind, how can people be so unthinking and uncaring and leave such a mess behind? And it's like you go to a shadi and everything is littered and, un, you know, uneaten food is left on the table. Uh, this is what I see happening in our corporate culture. You know, people are riding roughshod over everybody. And what's raining to me, I just have to sit and deal with this. 
And once I've dealt with that, then I say, okay, now we've got five minutes left, let's do some training. <laughs> so I'm more of a janitor. I, in this presentation, I will make mistakes because I'm not perfect. And hopefully you point them out and I will observe from that. And finally, the great Latin expression, caveat dum tor, which means buyer beware. Whatever you want to buy from me comes without any warranty and without any guarantee. Uh, it can break down any time. So it's your call. Clear? Oh yeah, so let's get going. We have a couple of chapters today. My early defining failures, let's see if I can. Does that help? Okay. Coming to grips with my failures. Morning candy, this is a very interesting phase of my life. Uh, my brush with leadership. My being an entrepreneur for almost uh, 14, 15 years and how that helped this trading business. And so maybe steps I took to get into this business, the early steps, what was that about? So let's start with the, uh, ultimately it was down to this. They're happily, they're gratefully, they're positive. And you know, whatever God throws out and you know, direction, just go with it and grow up. Can we have, uh, somebody just ask those guys to hold it down up? I was born in a, a very nice community, probably the most privileged community in the world. It was called Atta Oil Company in Morga, five minutes outside of Rahul Bendy. It was a refinery with a wonderful colony built by the British. And you know, when the British build something, first they do is they build the colony and then they build the plant. So they made sure you know, it is filled with all the amenities and luxuries and those wonderful swimming pool and tennis courts and clubs and you know playing fields and these bungalows we lived in had huge lawns, five or six lawns. And, but the best part about growing up in other oil was that the smartest people this country produced, they were hired. So all the engineers, all the administrators, all the managers that were the best in anything anywhere in the world, this company would grab them and bring them in. And then they'd all live residentially as a community, cut off from civilization. Now that's one hell of an environment to grow up in. So my friends were people like Malia Lodi, uh, um, Zarar Adib, who was fourth commander, uh, Azam Jamil, who was a great tennis player and uh, the director at Serena. Um, some real celebs, uh, Azmat Said, who is now the Chief Justice, uh, uh, you know, we used to sit and discuss socialism, and we were only like eight years old, he was 11, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I saw these vendors deal with one another, organize events, socialize, it was a very family-oriented community run by very responsible, very mature, very qualified adults. And I think that had a profound impact on us. Just that exposure to these very bright engineers and technology types and everything else. And, and my, so my early experiences were very good. And we all developed a passion for sports, which stayed throughout our lives with all the kids who grew up there. Either we were tennis players, or we were swimmers, or squash players, or golfers, or cricketers, or hockey. The C. Bunda, the guy who scored that winning goal against India in the 1960 Olympics, you know, he was on our team. And his other team player was Heather Rani, who was my director uh, for, what, uh, 20 years when I was running uh, the family businesses. So, you know, we had this amazing sportsman spirit and this amazing spirit he bore, this team. And that's something that really helped me a lot in training. But then I came to Gramazon <coughs> here. And that was a horrible call. And uh, and I failed everything. I just didn't like the authority, the way I suddenly seen it in Karachi. My teachers in, in Pindi were very caring, very loving, and suddenly I was thrown into this dog eat dog, hyper competitive, super achieving environment. And uh, and I thought the system was broken. And it was. For me it was a broken system. <coughs> So I rebelled, and that actually had a profound impact on me when I went into training because 
At some point, I made a commitment that as long as there's even one kid in this world that is going through the pain or went through the pain I went through, my soul will not rest. I will do something about it. So later on, I trained almost 5,000 teachers in how to teach while connecting with kids and how to teach in a fun, easy manner rather than all those idiotic books that I could not understand. Uh, what saved me was swimming, competitive swimming. I mean, that, to this day, is my passion. If I can figure out any way of making a lot of money by swimming, I swear to you, I'd be doing that. You know, I just, I love it and it, it saves me. But what it did was that, and it's really interesting, I never won anything in swimming not even second or third place in an ordinary club competition till I was 17. Now for a swimmer, that's like many years of not winning anything. And the first time I stood on the podium winning anything, it was as a national champion of Pakistan. So how did that happen and how did that change my life? But what it did was it created my identity as a swimmer. So even now when I meet people for many years, it's all relief, swimmer. And I realize that's very important to have an identity when you're growing up. So people know you by at least one thing that you're good at. And, uh, and then I'll come back, when I come to the training part, how the swimming analogy helped me with it. There's a, a annual general meeting going on for national finance. So obviously the shareholders are <laughs> fighting over how to divide the pie, which is obviously either shrinking or increasing. So I'm, I apologize for this question. Another place that I got really lucky was that I had a, I had a brilliant dad and a real innovator. Uh, he started National Refinery, the companies who stayed over meeting, started Parco, he started Parag. Uh, Petroman, Bakai Oils, NR Petrotech Services. So he was a real innovator and a, and a man who traveled around the world and his friends were from all over the world. And they would come and spend time with him and they would socialize and do business. And he did something that I thought was really smart. He would have me in on all those discussions. And I'd just sit around, I'd be playing with my toys and as I grew up, I'd stop playing my toys. I might listen to them and tune out and not understand what's happening. And I remember one day a guy asked him, one of his friends, a very smart engineer, who had come from Amos, who asked him, you know, Amos, why is Ramin here? Is he playing with his friends? And he says, no, uh, this is more useful for him. So he says, but how will he understand what we're talking about? He says, it doesn't matter that he understands now, it's just going to his head, and over time it will germinate. And that was so true, because what I heard, and them talk about at that time didn't make sense, but over the years it started to come together. So it's like I gained all their experience at a very young age. And that was just <coughs> phenomenal for me because my sense of curiosity then really grew. So I remember this one discussion they would have, he was having with some CEOs, and I must have been 11 years old, and they were talking about some guys that they were thinking of promoting to the next level, and they were having this discussion, discussing his personality and his achievements. And and I remember looking at hearing that and I'm saying, oh, so that's how it happens. Very interesting. I said, that's how this happens. That's, how, that's what this company is. That's what companies are. And people work up and they're evaluated and you know, viewed and trained and looked at. And so at a very young age, I started figuring out what this game was all about. Again, it came in really handy later on. Ah. So, now here's something very really interesting. So Zindi So 1971, um, the hostilities, things were warming up, heating up with India across the border. And uh, so we lived in a very precarious neighborhood called Nalata, in Queensroad. So on the left, on the right side was PNS Dalawa, on the other side was Navy Navy Bridge, a mile across, uh, not even half a mile across the creek, uh, Shinna Creek was a storage tank for all the oil supplies of Pakistan. Then we had the cotton exchange uh, uh, whole sector, which uh, now has become a container terminal. So we had like we were surrounded by like six targets, six vital targets, all within like a 500 yard radius. Uh, so what 
the and of course the Dada was run by the KPT, which is mostly enabled people. So they were very conscious of safety. So they ran this very advanced, progressive civil defense program for the youth of the area. I was only 13, but my buddy said, Dali, would you be trained there and would you be trained there? So they said, yeah, they roll up, I have a job, we are. So they just kind of put an extra chair. So there I was, you know, this young skinny kid, you know, learning all about civil defense and everything else. And then the war broke out. And sure enough, we were commissioned, and we saw a lot of action. I mean, every night, you know, there'd be action, and we'd go out and make sure that curfew was being uh, uh, implemented, and the blackouts were being implemented, and so forth. And <clears throat> so that went on for a lot of nights, and we, we were all sleep deprived. And so during the day, we'd all sort of party and hang around and go and inspect the damage, and so on and so forth. And at nights, we would all be on guard, and then we would do our patrolling. And uh, one day this car came, and these cars were all sort of had uh, been camouflaged. You know. So all the shine, the luster had been taken off. It looked like it was in the air, and even the headlights were like painted black and stuff like that. And this car came at me, and my dad said, Just get in the car, somebody wants to talk to you. I was 13. So I, I lined up at PTV. And there's this gentleman that I never heard of, but he was very strange because he was talking to me, his eyes, he had his eyes closed off. And he was the great Hashim Raza. And he was interviewing me. And I had no idea what was going on. I was just sat there with my little helmet in front of the little kid talking away and asking his questions, whatever he was saying. So his last question was, what did your mother say about all this? They said, the bombs are flying and you get up and you go out and everything. I said, uh, well, I said, well, last night I was sleeping and you know, the air raid siren went off. So my mom came, she woke me up and she said, Ja putra, murti and, and, and the interview finished on that. And the next day, um, my dad came home and he said, man, the damnedest thing happened today. I get a call from PTV and they said, you know, your son yesterday, when he finished the interview, our telephone lines got jammed. Because all these people were calling and saying we were thinking of evacuating the city, but when we heard it, we decided to stay. <laughs> and that, and that, stuck, that stuck to me. I said, wow, you mean I actually had an impact? You had 13, that's like awesome. And uh, of course, later on, I followed it up with a real stupid act five years later. Uh, we were over at, um, at Oyster Rocks. You know how oyster rocks are, like one side slopes and the other side is like this straight walk. Well, guess who decides to go up this one? <laughs> so I land up with Fred, and I'm almost halfway up there. It's all sandstone very slick, so I wanted to take a big fall, but you know, stupid is my middle name, so I'm very good. And half, almost half, almost to the top, I noticed these two metal things, that thing, jumping out. And they were unexploded bombs from the war five years ago. And they were all corroded and the tails were sticking out. So I started taking out trees and putting them in my pocket and throwing them down. And I went down, I picked them up and, you know, went home. And that evening I was having dinner at, uh, at Miller's at Stan's house, who was the chairman of KPT. And we were just having dinner and everything else. And I said, oh, by the way, Uncle, uh, I found a box. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped these things on the table. And he looked at me. <laughs> great man, he's a wonderful man of tremendous integrity and valor and honor. And, uh, so he uh, immediately called up the bomb disposal. So I'm at school the next day, and again they get me out of school. Now it's the TV people, and they said, we got to interview you. I said, sure, go ahead. They said, no, we got to take you right back there. So we went back to Oyster Rocks. They said, where did you find the bomb? I said, way up there. They said, why don't you go up there and show up? I said, no, no, no that's not happening. <laughs> progressively less stupid every day. <laughs> so, so they said, okay, um, so talk to us, how did this happen? So I, you know, I showed them how it happened. So that was the second and the last time I came on national television. <laughs> so, anyway, I thought I was a little side. So, so all these things happened, my first motivation speech, my dad's companions, my love for swimming, my absolute distaste for books, but this amazing experience growing up in other boys. And what brings me 
what the real key to this training business for me has been this amazing diversity when I look back at my life. I've got friends who are rednecks, I have friends who are Republicans, who are Jews, who are atheists, who are black, who are white, who are communists. I've got friends all over the world of all persuasion, all beliefs, alcoholics, priests, prostitutes, name it, they're all my friends. And I think that has enriched my life so much, this diversity of thought and ideas and you know, scientists and businessmen and smugglers. And, you know, I just make friends everywhere. I just go out and I say, look, let's be friends. You know, let's, how can I help you? And that's the way I've learned to make friends. Is I don't say, you know, what is it you can do for me? I always start with, what can I do for you? And, uh, and, and that, I think, this diversity and having multiple interactions has really helped me. So if you really, really, really want to be a, a great sort of a trainer who, I don't know if I can say I know what I'm talking about, or I know what I'm doing, but I certainly know people now. And I'm very understanding. You know, even those that we tend to, we love to hate, I have no hatred for them. I have nothing but love for them. I respect them. They might do stuff that you might find harmful, or, but to me it's like, they'll get over. So that's the number one thing that uh, I bring to the brain. Now coming to grips with my failure. So I landed up, so there I was, you know, did ter ter uh, sort of terrible all the way up to 10th grade, and then something snapped in me. I wanted to leave Pakistan for higher education. So I said, man, okay, whether I like it or not, I better start studying. So for the first time in my life, I started studying. Fortunately, I had some real geniuses in my class who went on to become great doctors and lawyers, you know, Baluddin Galani, Narvan Galani, and Galani, and Etzak Barzeli, Dr. Barzeli, great economist, with plenty of books. So all these guys were my classmates, I mean, the Khani, the Lexan group, and you know, the list goes on. These are all brilliant kids. And there I was with one stupid one in them. So, you know, I turned to these guys to help me pass. So each one of them was good in some subjects and we studied. Uh, and somehow I sort of just made it into A levels. I got the grades and made it into A levels. But then again, I moved off in, in the A levels. And my first brush with leadership there was I was appointed Sweden House Captain, which was a very big deal. But it wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to be head boy, so I lost interest. And uh, so Badr Vilani, who was a very diligent guy, he was, he was a monitor of Sweden House Captain, he decides to take the load and organized everything, all the teams, and give us all the leadership, and he gave me all the credit for it. And that was my first leadership lesson. Get others to do your work for you. <laughs> 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 if you can somehow teach people to do that, you'll always come out smelling like a rose. Um, but then it was time for me for, for going to college. I found that I actually did make some enemies, my teachers. And when I went to them for recommendations, they said, we don't know you, you never showed up to class. And uh, so finally Mr. Davis was a vice principal, because he had his partial to athletes and you know, I was already sort of an accomplished athlete, but he wrote this glowing, um, uh, this glowing recommendation, but if you read it carefully, it, everything was a lie and everything was the truth, because he wrote it so cleverly that everything had a double meaning. You know, so he says, Ramiz uh, accomplishes all his tasks unassumingly. <laughs> Translation, he doesn't give a damn. <laughs> but somebody else reading it says, man, this guy's like cool as a cucumber. <laughs> so he was, anyway, so there's a very good business school uh, called Babson in uh, Massachusetts. It was sort of ranked as the number one school for entrepreneurship in the world. I somehow managed to get in, squeak in. And maybe it was because of my swimming, the a big swimmer is coming. And, uh, but Babson was my turning point. Uh, something snapped in me. I mean, the way the teachers just walked into the classroom, the body language, the tone, the, how they explained things. The stuff that I was routinely flunking, I started pacing. And then I got the dean's list, I graduated with a high distinction. And I took a very unusual major and a minor, society and technology. And all we did was project into the future. We became what's known as futurists. We looked into what would the world be like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. What would our values be like? What would our civilization look? How would we work, love, play? You know, all the changes that we're trying to incorporate. 
which was phenomenal for me because it made me very forward looking. It made me going to the future all the time. I had an interest for history on the side, so <coughs> I still do. So that was a great combination for you. Learn your history and then you think, always think about the future and construct different sort of scenarios. So this helped me a lot in training because you always can learn that your default setting is preempting stuff in the future. You know, looking ahead, and rather than looking at what happened, you think, okay, what do my customers want? What, what do they want six months from now? Where is their business now? Where will their business be two years from now? So what are they going to need two years from now? What products, what services? So let me position myself for that. So when they're ready to take it, I'm ready to sell it. So that was the sort of great training for me. But what Batson really taught me, and this I can never thank this college enough for, taught me a skill I use to this day, which has made a lot of money for me. Well, a lot of money is uh, relative. But what I think happens to be a lot of money, my needs are very little, so any money I get is a lot of money. It taught me how to ask the right question. Asking the right questions directs everybody's energy in a certain direction. So it's really critical to get the questions right. So my global clients right now, uh, you know, they keep hiring me, keep bringing me back. I get very curious. I said, you know, it's very flattering to keep calling me back, but why do you really call me? And the guy says, man, because nobody asks the kind of questions you do. You know, you ask these weird questions and you suddenly go, you start thinking about it. <laughs> you know, you, you get us to think. You know, your questions are so strange, they come from nowhere, and you know, every day we are working, 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 and suddenly you put us in this area where we haven't thought about. <coughs> so that's what I would urge you to do. You know, when you're out there with your customers and you're trying to design your training and all, you know, just come up with the best question you can. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just a lot of stupid people who are too scared to ask questions thinking they look stupid. Then I moved to Houston and I uh, started a company, my first company, which promptly failed after a year. That failure of a year taught me more than any Harvard MBA. And, but what it also did was when I started my next company, I realized I needed a network. And I was really fortunate because I, I got three mentors. And, and they taught me, and I'll just tell you know, why those those mentors were really interesting combination. But what they taught me was something really, again, a gift. They taught me to put myself out there. They taught me to not sell myself short, to think big and to do big. They said, if you're going to do anything in life, then do it on a massive scale. That's what Texans are really good at. If they're going to build something, they build it like the biggest, the price. I think the only competition they're getting now is from the bike, which is why they have like, six flights a day with Emirates between Houston and Dubai. I mean, they're like soulmates. You know, they do everything big. And they've got this amazing vision, and that's what I really learned from them. Especially the rich in Texas are amazingly, are amazing people. Big hearts, big wallets, big ambitions, big egos. You know, they, when they love, they love like, like we do, you know, some them case. When they hate you, man, they hate you. Like they're an enemy for life, they shoot you. And literally they shoot you. They all carry guns. You know? I mean it's just amazing people. They have so much passion in life. And I love them. <coughs> enjoy life. Enjoy everything. Get everything out of life. So whether you're out there working or training or whatever, just suck everything out of it. You know, it's just a great way to live. And I can't thank this city enough for everything else. This this lesson I've learned. But the biggest gift I got was I married Kevin, my wife, who happened to be the first trainer I ever met in my life. Till then I didn't know there was such a thing as a trainer. And she used to run a direct mail advertising company, which was uh, the second fastest growing business in Houston at that time. But in her spare time, she was teaching others how to do this through a, a business called the Learning Annex. Learning Annex has been in the news these days a lot. You know uh, Kiyosaki, this rich dad, poor dad guy? Well, he just lost the fortune to declared bankruptcy because of Learning Annex. Because 
learning analytics was a platform like uh, Torque and Ocara, and he used it, but he did, when he became big, he didn't pay for what they took him to court, the court ruled in their favor, and you know, and he had to declare bankruptcy last week. But what, be that as it may, so Karen was doing this stuff with the learning analytics, and one day uh, she said, uh, this was when I was in, we were just dating, and uh, so she said, why don't you come along and you know, see what I do? And I thought, you know, there'd be somebody out there. In those days, we didn't have all this technology. We had those uh, overhead projectors. So I thought there'd be somebody out there, blah, 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 you know. So I walk in there, and man, they're having fun. There's a lot of energy and laughter, and it wasn't anything like a classroom. And at the end, they were all turning out these very creative packages for direct mail. You know, how do you get people to open up the mail? In, in the US, you get like, this junk mail, which you take out the mailbox and you go to the trash can and you just throw it there and you just separate out where my bills and everything else goes in the trash can. But she knew that so she wanted to make sure her stuff gets open. And she was teaching how to do that and that was such a you know lively process. So I said, man, you make money doing this? She said, yeah. I said, well, this was like a fun way to make money. You know, it's like win-win. You know, everybody, you're having fun, they're having fun. They do good in their business, you make money, and wow, what a great thing. So that's when I started getting hooked to this. And she pushed me into training. She said, man, <coughs> I think you can be a really, really good friend. And I said, oh, right. When we came back here, we moved here in 87. Um, one of our family businesses, we had this consulting company. And it had a small trading division. And they had this one 16 mm film by this, uh, who's that big guru in the 16 Ford man? What's the biggest name? No, before that. Drucker. Huh? Drucker. So they had this knowledge worker film with a bunch of questions. The license, they bought the license, you know, like the time of audition or whatever. And, there was, and every time these two trainers would go and they'd play this movie and they'd ask these questions, blah, blah, blah. And you know, so I saw them once in 19. I don't think this business will do too well. But my dad said, you know what? Uh, this training part of our business is not doing too well. So why don't you uh, do something about it? So I, thinking, you know, one of the things about being young is you think you can do anything. So I went up to PSO and I said, uh, you know, we can train your people. And I said, yeah, yeah, piece of cake, man. We got this. We got this moving. And I have these 20 questions, and by the time they're done answering those questions and seeing the movie, they would have learned everything they need to learn about magic. <laughs> so the guy, that guy was probably a bigger idiot than me. He said, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I remember, I show up there, and the U-shape, and everyone's wearing suits and ties, and they're all overweight, and they're all looking at me like this. Like, we don't want to be here today, <laughs> you know. And what is it that you can teach us, you 30-year-old punk? You know, <laughs> when we've been in the oil business all our life, <laughs> and uh, I could like to move, I'm in trouble. You know. So, so it's my turn to come up and do all the introductions. Everything is so formal. I wasn't used to all of that. Everybody gets up and introduces. You know, there's so much procedure there just to get it going. You know, it took like 45 minutes, and then one manager comes and he stands behind the podium and goes. It is indeed a pleasure. You know, some flunky wrote this thing out. <laughs> He's reading it, and you're all kids page. He skips lines, and he skips. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm tuned out. Like my heart is not the You know, get the buzz again. So I get on the. So it's my turn. I get on the board, and and I write. What is management? And I freeze. I swear to you. I just my brain just freezes. So I turn around and I say. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk back and I sit down and Karen is sitting there. She says, what happened? I said, I can't do this. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> she put them, she gave me one of those looks. <laughs> you know, it's like, darling, if you want to sleep in my bed tonight. <laughs> or any other night. <laughs> any time in your life. <laughs> You've got to get it together and go back out. <laughs> anyway, that was a disaster. Uh, to say the least, that, that, you know, Manitoba, I said, man, this is not for me. Are you kidding? So I went back to selling my products and bikes, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. <coughs> and uh, so that's 
what happened here. But this was what I got out of it. The whole game, what I saw the Texans do, what I saw, what Batson did for me, what I saw. This was the American game. And, uh, and it has, to this day, this is what I do. I, when I take decisions that, that just throw everybody away. Uh, my, the biggest decision of this nature, four years ago, I decided to liquidate <coughs> everything and distribute everything. And I said, I don't need money, I don't need bank accounts, I don't need a house, I don't need a car. I, I just want to be light and free, and I just passed everything on to everybody else. And to this day, I don't have a bank account, I don't have a credit card, I have nothing. And I get by really well. I fly first class, I'm living in the best hotels, and get eat the best food, and that's great. I love it. But I have nothing to tie me down or make me worry about it. Oh, I stopped on here. Oh, Gordy, Gordy, you know. Oh, rupiah, rupiah, the value of your big dollar, please, dollar. Man, I'm done with that. I don't need that stuff in my life. A lot of people, it's very important to them for their security. And uh, But to me, money, so if you, want, if you want to accumulate money, it's not a indication of your work. To me, it's an, it's an indication of your distrust in the goodness of humanity. Uh, that's what it is. Because I think if I ever get into trouble, <clears throat> my money won't save me, it's you guys. You'll come to my help, and I pay them that. So I don't need it. You know. Anyway, so that's it. <laughs> so now I get not comes the fun stuff. You know, remember, I'm still stupid, right? <laughs> so I think now I can be really successful in business. And uh, so I look around and I had a really successful business in Houston, which we sold and moved back here. We had some money. And I decided that yeah, in Pakistan, I have to go to the Zangla. 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 I have to go to the so we, I tried to I find out who's the best rust protection chemicals and compounds in the world. Turned out to be a Swedish company. I land up there, you know, good school talker, and get this exclusive agreement with them to be the distributor, manufacturer, repackager. You know, whatever you could think of, I said, I can do it. <laughs> and I would land up there and uh, start trying to sell it. And people can look at me. Are you serious? Are you out of your mind? You think we're going to pay you this kind of money for the sun's after? No, no, no. And I was looking at them and saying, are you stupid? Have you seen the, how much it's costing you to have corrosion as part of your daily life? So anyway, so we weren't getting anywhere. We both looked at each other as being stupid. But in the meantime, blessing dropped from heaven, which was what? My containers got stuck at customs. So I went up there, I said, what's the matter, you know, take the duty, take this, let it go. <coughs> he said, no, there's a problem with this, what's the problem with it, you know, this is bad, this is bad, this, this is not right, paperwork is not complete. And finally, I got this feeling in it, and he said, Saab, they can now be Pakistan, they can Pakistan. Jada Sharif Pandey, he goes to start. I said, you mean, really? I thought you did, you guys are right. I can't do that. I don't know how to do it. And I don't want to do it. I don't want to start on the wrong foot. I just come back to my country. And I want to do it right. So they said, uh, no, not work, not going to happen. So I kept trying, kept trying. Negotiations kept failing. I was driving out one day from New Custom House, and I saw this beautiful building that's always there. That, you know, those structures, the old Custom House, and I saw this rusted sign archway that says National Institute of Customs and Excise. So I asked my driver, I said, I look, I bet you that you can't get out Now the customer will be training here. Ooh, I'm very old. I said, you took my lovely baby, you could be cut there with it. So maybe I should. I hope there wasn't food in that. So, so, uh, so we had this, uh, so within like half an hour, I was sitting in front of this very enlightened man by the name of Safari Park, and he was the principal of National very enlightened guy, very well read, strong personality, decisive decision maker. And I said, you know, you're running an institute and I've just come from the States and I've learned I've worked with major oil companies and 